Kad je sir od magrećeg mleka u pitanju, jede se redka priča. Ako je nešto redko i jedino na svetu, to svi ljudi sveta žele da probaju. Very good. Moje ime je Slobodan Simić i ja proizvodim sir od magrećeg mleka. Sixteen years ago, Slobodan Simic bought a dozen donkeys. His herd has since grown to nearly 300. But hundreds of donkeys doesn't necessarily mean gallons of donkey milk. Unlike cows or goats, donkeys produce milk in very small quantities while nursing their foal. Ono sam ja se zapitao zašto nema sira od magarećeg mleka i vidio sam da to niko nije uspio da proizvede. So he tried to make cheese from his donkey milk, but it turns out that process was far from simple. Problem sa pravljenjem sira je u tome što magreće mleko nema dovoljno kazeina koji služi za zgrušnjavanje mleka. So he keeps his methods a secret. Znači jedan dugotrajan proces koji traži određene tajne i rješavanje određenih problema koje drugi ljudi nisu rešili. To je ono što omogućava da taj sir bude najređi i najskuplji. Mi trenutno smo jedini koji znamo napraviti sir od magrećeg mleka. The cheese goes for around $500 a pound, and it has a rich, nutty, and earthy flavor. It is known to be quite filling, but just a select few have tasted it. You can only get donkey cheese in Serbia. I ne postoji niko ko je probao da je mislio da je to nešto loše. Znači, jede se nešto što je posebno i što nema na drugim mestima i običnom, u običnoj prodavnici kupiti. Quindi non c'è segreto nelle, nel filindeo, il segreto è nelle mani. Nel corso degli anni ho cercato di perfezionarla, infatti io riesco da un rotolino di pasta ad ottenere 256 fili, talmente sottile che sono forse l'unica che riesce a fare questi 256 fili. Il mio nome è Paola Braini e mi dedico a questa pasta che si chiama Suvelindeo che lavoro da oltre 40 anni. Il filindeo esiste dalla notte dei tempi, quindi è una pasta antica che lavoriamo solo a nuoro. Gli ingredienti del filindeo sono semola di grano duro, acqua e sale. E quindi io procedo con questo movimento delle mani dove piego la pasta per otto volte in modo da creare questi fili sottilissimi da adagiare sul fondo di legno. Dopodiché si mette a dessicare al sole quando c'è una bella giornata oppure a casa, eh, all'interno della casa a temperatura ambiente. Non c'è un macchinario che la possa produrre. È una pasta che viene lavorata solo ed esclusivamente a mano. E in tutto saremo una decina di persone che lo sappiamo fare, in tutto il mondo. Questa pasta si tramanda da madre in figlia. Comunque però è sempre una tradizione di famiglia che noi ci teniamo a tenere in famiglia. Non esiste un'altra pasta al mondo come questa. びっくりっていうか、皆さん見られてびっくりされますし、みんなからまだ売れてないんだよねって言われるんですけど、色が白くて種が赤く、手締めやすい人です。いちごを作っています。ワンパック約 白いイチゴはよりよく白く作れば作るほど果実のこすれ、傷ともに赤よりも目立ってしまいますので、製品になる確率は十分の1ぐらいに減ってしまいます。ちょっと高価なイチゴになってしまいます。
色形サイズともにトータルバランスで優れたいちごです味も立派ないちごだと思います意外とこうなんていうかな奥深いようなインパクトはないんだけどずっとこう不思議な感じで美味しいっていうような感じですもんね白い宝石で作り始めてもう約4年白いいちご作りで楽しいこと幸せを感じることは自分が想像できない味香りそして形っていうのが生まれてきてくるのをよく私自身が実感できるからですいや目指すところはいちごで他の果物の味がするとか甘いとか美味しいとかお客さんに絶対このいちごは間違いないと言われるまで突き進むしかないですね。There's three things that are most important to chefs. First is flavor, second is flavor, and third is flavor. Flavor rules. Built on the fertile former lake bottom soil of northern Ohio, the Chef's Garden is a 300 acre family farm that grows specialty produce for some of the world's best restaurants. The Chef's Garden is a small family farm that has the good fortune of working directly with some of the greatest chefs in the world. In many cases, we're working with plant growers that are breeding to be able to create new plants. Not genetic modification, but genetic selection. The farm grows produce of all shapes and sizes, like miniature carrots, these white strawberries, and almost a hundred varieties of microgreens. But the Jones family wasn't always the chef's garden. My parents had had some very successful years. In 1983, they had a very devastating hailstorm, and ultimately, the farm collapsed. We were dealt a new deck of cards and found opportunity within a disaster. We met a European-influenced chef, Iris Balin, who said, grow me varieties for flavor. Grow me varieties without chemical. I want a zucchini bloom. I thought this lady was absolutely crazy. Little did we know, she knew a heck of a lot more about it than we did. And that really opened our eyes to another whole world out there. We hooked up with some really great chefs early on. Folks like Danielle Ballou and Jean-Georges von Richten and Alain Ducasse and Michel Richard and then Thomas Keller and Charlie Trotter and, and Ritz Carlton chefs and Four Seasons chefs. And they've allowed us an existence in agriculture. We're indebted to those chefs that have given us the privilege and the path to be able to follow our dream of farming. So it's that symbiotic relationship of chef and farmer working together for the greater good. And here we are 35 years later, still working to get better. To the best of our ability, right now, in this place, I think we're doing the right thing. And I think that trumps every other reason for whatever you do in this life. It's red and pricey. It's a critter and a delicacy. It's the creme de la creme of seafood. But this beloved summertime favorite was once thought of as the poor man's food. Say what? It is said that in the early 16th century, as the first pilgrims began to settle in bay areas of America, that the oceans overfloweth with lobster. No, literally, they overfloweth. Imagine a shore with a lobster wall two feet tall. As one would expect, the settlers ate them up, until, like anything eaten three times a day, they got sick of them, eventually deeming them the cockroaches of the sea. After that, lobsters were used as fertilizer, fish bait, and ultimately, prison food. They were fed so often to inmates that there was even a law enacted to protect said inmates from cruel and unusual lobster punishment. So then how did lobster become the succulent delicacy we all know and love? Fast forward to the mid-1800s. Canned food became a thing, as did the railroad. Lobsters were canned and shipped to Middle America. At the same time, Middle Americans started traveling to New England for fresh lobster. By the late 1880s, prices began to surge. And by World War II, lobsters became the pricey specialty we've all grown to enjoy. Mm -hmm. 